It is a, a brand new year. The year's already off to a great start. Uh, the Patriots lost yesterday, so um, I know. Might be the loudest amen I get today. Uh, great, uh, great to be here. Great to uh, have a chance now to open God's Word together. So if you have a Bible with you this morning, uh, go ahead and open it to Matthew chapter 8. Uh, I did tell you last week that we would be beginning a brand new series in January, and that series is going to explore the life and the faith of Abraham through Genesis chapters 12 to 25. The series uh, will be called Between Promise and Fulfillment, and uh, I made that promise last week. We'd be starting that series. I am going to delay that a week, and part of the reason is just so you can see that there's often a delay between promise and fulfillment. (laughs) Um, something like that. Um, but we are in Matthew chapter 8 uh, this morning. And I think at the start of a new year, it's good to just remind ourselves uh, what it means to follow Jesus and the commitment we have to follow him all through this year. So we're going to be looking at a short section in Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to read uh, verses 18 to 22 for you. This is God's word, and this is what it says. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side, and a scribe came up to him and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his hat. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own. Well, for a short passage, it packs quite a punch, doesn't it? Jesus' interaction with these two would-be disciples sounds kind of foreign to our modern ears. I mean, we tend to soft-sell things. We're fearful of turning anyone away. And as I was thinking about these verses and just how different they sound to us, thought about two different books written by two different pastors in two different eras. The first one is a book called The Cost of Discipleship. It was written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor of a Lutheran church during the Nazi regime. And Bonhoeffer wrote his book as a wake-up call to a complacent church. The great enemy of the Christian faith, according to Bonhoeffer, was what he called cheap grace. So here's a sampling of what he had to say in that book. He said, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. Costly grace, on the other hand, is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will gladly go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all his goods. It's the kingly rule of Christ, for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. And then he went on to say, such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it costs a man his life, and it's grace because it gives a man his only true life. It's costly because it condemns sin, and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son, and what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Well, those were his words about the cost of following Jesus and what it means to following Jesus. The other book that came to my mind was, is one of the best-selling Christian books of the 21st century. The book is called Your Best Life Now. It was written by Joel Osteen, the smiling pastor of the largest church in America. And here's a sampling of what he presents about Jesus' invitation to us. He said, what do you see when you look into your future? Do you see yourself as getting stronger, healthier, and happier? Is your life filled with God's blessing, favor, and victory? You must begin to see it if you truly hope for it to come to pass. 
elsewhere. He said, God is in the multiplication business. It doesn't matter what your need is today. God wants to increase you. God can make you seem bigger than you really are. He can make you look more powerful. He knows how to multiply your influence, your strength, and your talent. And the book basically follows a formula that gets repeated over and over throughout the book. So you should pay attention because I'm going to save you the 20 bucks from buying the book. Here's the formula for whatever it is you want to experience in your life. The way to blank is not to blank. Instead, you need to blank. Now, you might say, but Joel, I can't do blank and blank. I know it's hard. Rise to the challenge. Don't let yourself get beat up or knocked down. God has much more for you. And as the title suggests, the basic premise of the book is that God wants you to have your best life now, a life free from Hardship, a life free from all financial stresses. Now, it is true that Jesus promises us an abundant life, but an abundant life is not necessarily a life of abundance. And I think the, different be- the difference between those two books and what those two pastors had to say is a stark contrast. And I actually think only one of them rings true with what Jesus tells us here. So I entitled this message, The Cost of Discipleship. Now, we're not doing a study on Bonhoeffer's book or Osteen's book. We're doing a study of these verses in Matthew chapter 8. What do we learn from them? And I think the first thing we should see is that Jesus was never interested in merely attracting a crowd. So let me just set the context for you. Matthew chapters 5 to 7 is where we have recorded Jesus delivering the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 8, and and as he does so, a a large crowd, he starts with his disciples, but then a large crowd gathers around to hear him. Then Matthew chapter 8 contains several miracles that Jesus did, and as he does so, the crowd keeps getting larger. And that's what brings us to verse 18. In verse 18, we've already read it, but it says, now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, He gave orders to his disciples to go and gather more people for the show. That's not what it says. It says, as this crowd gathered, he gave orders to go over to the other side, away from the crowd. And this is actually a pattern in Jesus' ministry. At the very moment, we would be tempted to say, oh, look at all these people flocking to see me. I've got to figure out a way to keep them here and keep them interested. At that moment, Jesus withdraws from the crowd. He doesn't seem overly impressed with the fact that people had traveled this great distance to come and hear him preach or to see him in action. In fact, Jesus is usually found thinning out the crowd, either by something he says or something he does. It's not that Jesus was against crowds. It's that he was able to discern the reason people had gathered. And if they had come for the wrong reasons... He wasn't content to just sort of mark them down as part of a new attendance record. And this runs contrary to the way a lot of churches do it today. There's a whole school of thought that basically tries to do church in such a way that no one would ever be offended by anything that is said. Let's do away with all the talk about sin and judgment. Let's not bore people with doctrine. Let's keep the sermon short and light. Let's bring people in with giveaways and let's send them home with three ways to have a better marriage. Now that's great if all you want to do is attract a crowd. But Jesus was interested in making disciples. And there's a difference between getting people to make decisions and making disciples. So I go to the gym on a, on a fairly regular basis, and when you go to the same gym long enough, you start to recognize lots of familiar faces. These are the people who are there consistently. You see them at the same times of the day or even different times of the day. But I went to the gym on January 2nd, and it was a totally different experience. I mean, there were lots of people I had never seen before. Now, many of them were no doubt uh, gifted a a gym membership for Christmas, or they decided that 2020 was going to be the year where they were going to be committed to getting healthy, and that's a great thing. The gym will be busier in January than it was in December, but many of those same people will not show up again once the calendar hits February. 
And some of the larger fitness clubs, they actually have it as part of their business plan that you won't show up. I mean, you'll, you'll pay the initiation fee. You'll, you'll kind of sign off on the preauthorized monthly dues. But that's what really matters, just getting you to make that decision or that initial commitment. But when you observe Jesus' pattern of ministry, you see something totally different. He wasn't interested in just getting people to make decisions. He was interested in making disciples. See, decisions sometimes get made in the heat of emotion, and oftentimes they don't last. Discipleship is about a long obedience in the same direction. And we can see the difference in those two approaches in the way that Jesus dealt with these two would-be disciples. And what we see with the first individual who approaches him is that Jesus is more interested in our lives than our words. So verse 18, after telling us that this large crowd had gathered, then verse 19 says, And a scribe came up to him and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, on the surface of it, that seems like that's a good way to approach Jesus. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. That's how committed I am. Now, it's possible that there's more in the man's statement than we might realize. It says he was a scribe, so this would mean he's already actively pursuing a life of devotion to God, or at least religious devotion. If, if you were a scribe in those days... You would try to attach yourself to a rabbi or a teacher of your choosing. You would find someone you wanted to study under or learn from, and you would ask him to take you on as one of his disciples. That seems to be what this man is trying to do. So if that's the case, why does Jesus give him the brush off here, right? The guy says, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, foxes have uh, have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Well, some commentators think that, that maybe there's some arrogance on the man's part as he approaches Jesus. One writer paraphrases the man's words like this, Teacher, as one Bible expert to another, I've noticed who's on your team thus far, fishermen, lepers, soldiers, and middle-aged women. Perhaps you could use someone with a head on his shoulders, with some religious respectability. Say someone like me, this is your lucky day, I'll follow you wherever you go. Well, I suspect that's probably reading too much into the man's statement. Jesus' answer to him is not, you're too proud to be one of my disciples. His answer is, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man, that's Jesus, has nowhere to lay his head. And what Jesus seems to be driving at is that it's great for you to say with your mouth or with your words that you'll follow me wherever I go, but you need to understand what that really means. You need to be prepared to count the cost. See, the man might have thought that becoming one of Jesus' disciples would put him on the fast track to success, right? He can have his best life now. Jesus is there to kind of bless all of his efforts. And Jesus wants him and he wants us to understand what it looks like to follow him. He's not impressed with shallow professions of faith. Now, we understand something about these shallow professions of faith, don't we? I think we all do. I mean, we all know what it's like to make great declarations of our devotion to God when we're singing or when we want God to come through for us in some way, only then to forget about our pledge or our commitment the next day or the next hour or the moment we walk out the back door. And So Jesus tells us this parable in Matthew chapter 21 to illustrate what this difference looks like. He said, what do you think? A man had two sons. And he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. And I would just say that our churches have far more people like the second son than the first, right? Lots of people who say, I'll go, sir. I'll do it. I'll go work in the vineyard. But who never actually follow through on their commitment. 
And Jesus is more interested in our lives than our words. Second thing we could say is that Jesus is more interested in our allegiance than our excuses. And we can see this from Jesus' interaction with the second would-be disciple. Listen again to verses 21 and 22. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Now, I think the moment we hear that, we think, wow, that sounds really harsh, cold. So there are a number of different suggestions of how we ought to understand Jesus' words here. It is possible that the man's father has either just died or is very ill and knocking on death's door. And if that's the case, then Jesus' response does sound kind of cold and harsh. Can't even stick around for his own father's funeral. Now, I'm not trying to take away the force of what Jesus says here, but I'm not sure that's the best way to understand it. Burials tended to happen quite quickly in ancient times, usually within 24 hours. So if the man's father had just died, it's unlikely he would be doing anything other than grieving and making preparations for the burial. I don't think that's what is being described here. So how should we understand this? Well, some commentators have suggested when Jesus says, let the dead bury their own, he's using hyperbole. He's overstating the case to make a point. And we know Jesus does this elsewhere. He tells us, look, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter heaven with only one hand than for you to wind up in hell with two hands. Or if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It's better for you to enter heaven with one eye than for you to be in hell with two good eyes. So he does sometimes use hyperbole. He uses uh, the the force of something to, to make us understand we need to deal radically with our sin. We need to take drastic action. That's his point. And it might be that that's what he's doing here. Let the dead bury their own could be a type of statement to, to say that, look, all relationships or the relationship with me is actually takes precedent over all of your other relationships. That's the force of what he's saying. It's also possible, though, that the man is simply saying, hey, look, Jesus, my dad is getting older now, and there's going to come a day where he's going to die, and I'm going to get my inheritance, and I will follow you then. And if that's the case, what he's really saying is that there are other things in his life that take precedence over following Jesus. He'll do it when it's more convenient. And I think however we take it, the point is actually the same. Jesus demands first place in the life of his followers. All other commitments become secondary. It's interesting to compare this account with the same account in the Gospel of Luke, where Luke tells us about a third would-be disciple who was present. So in Luke it says, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another, this is the third one now, said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, when you take those stories together, we're reminded there are lots of different reasons people will give for not following Jesus. There are lots of excuses that we might have for not following him wholeheartedly, at least not just yet. You might remember this parable that Jesus told as well. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife. And therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. Like all of those who were invited had these excuses. Oh, look, I can't attend right now. I've just bought this field. 
oh, I've just gotten married. I can't actually do this right now. You know what, Jesus, I'd like to follow you, but I, you know, I want to say goodbye to those at home, and I kind of got some things I want to take care of. Jesus is more interested in our allegiance than our excuses. And what he's calling these two would-be disciples to is a life of following him, to make him the priority. He's never interested in merely attracting a crowd. The second thing we see in this passage, which is that Jesus always wants his followers to count the cost. I mean, that's essentially what he's saying to these two would-be disciples. He's telling them, who are saying, look, we're interested in following you. And he's, what he's saying to them is, okay, that, that's great, but there's a cost to doing it. Are you prepared? See, I've been a pastor long enough to, to see lots of people make emotional decisions to follow Jesus, only to see them fall away at the first sign of trouble. I've seen lots of people who have declared, look, I will follow him wherever he leads me, only to see them fall away at the first sign of trouble or when things get difficult. Jesus was not a bait and switch salesman. He didn't sort of, you know, promise one thing and then, you know, you didn't get to read the fine print. He reads the fine print for us. He says, if you want to follow me, you should know. There's a cost to it. Listen to what he said in Luke chapter 14. He said, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet who comes, he who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. What Jesus says to us is you need to understand the cost of discipleship. What does it mean to follow me? There is a cost to being a follower of Jesus. And so with the rest of our time, I just want to answer the question is, what is the cost of discipleship? Now listen, salvation is free, but there is a cost to devoting our lives to following Jesus. Not all of us will pay the same cost. But I want to highlight five areas that help us understand what the cost of discipleship might look like for you. Firstly, there might be a financial cost. Now, God is the giver of wealth. I mean, he prospers people financially. But his best life for you might not mean financial security. And when I say there might be a financial cost, I'm not meaning that, you know, it's tithes and offerings. But God calls all of us to invest our resources in the advance of his kingdom. What I mean by saying that there might be a financial cost of discipleship is that Jesus tells us that we cannot serve both God and money. He doesn't say it's hard for you to do it. He says it's impossible for you to do that. There's a conflict that comes up. There will be. If you are a follower of Jesus you will regularly be confronted with a choice between serving God and serving money. You will have to decide again and again where your allegiance lies. That choice confronts us when we make decisions about whether or not to be ethical with billing customers or honest with filing our taxes. We make it, we face it when we make a choice between living for temporary pleasures and investing in things of eternal significance. It's a choice that presents itself every day. The cost might be that you give up a lucrative career to be a missionary. That might be a calling God places on your life. The cost might mean different things for different people. So in Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist tells a tax collector not to collect more than he's authorized. He tells a Roman soldier not to extort money from anyone. That's what it would cost them. But when Jesus dealt with the rich young ruler, he told him to sell all his possessions and give the proceeds to the poor and then come follow him. See, discipleship costs different people differently and it may just be that because of our attachment to things those are the things that have to be stripped away so we can understand that Jesus is more than enough 
So I'm not even going to pretend to know what discipleship might cost you in a financial sense, but I know it will cost you something. The good news in that is that while Jesus calls all of his followers to relinquish financial security, it's not a real security anyway. Anything that can be taken away from us, it's not real. It's an illusion. And even more importantly, there is a reward for those who pay this cost. Listen to Jesus' promise. He said, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. So while there's a cost, and that cost might be high, the reward is even greater, so much greater. Second thing to be aware of is that there might be a familial or relational cost. Again, I say might be because not everyone will pay a price with their family or in their relationships. Some of you have strong, supportive families that encourage you in following Jesus. Uh, Jesus. Others of you might be the only Christian in your family. And I can speak to that from personal experience. There was a cost to that. I've mentioned this to you uh, before. A few years back, one of the books I read that impacted me was book written by Nabil Qureshi. The book is called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, and it's the story of Nabil as he, who was raised in a loving Muslim home but became a Christian in his 20s, it was his story, and part of his story revolves around his friendship with David Wood, a fellow student at the University of Old Dominion. And one day David asked Nabil if he would want to know if Christianity was true, and if he discovered that it was, would it make any difference in his life? And here's what he said. He said, yes, I would want to know because I want to know the truth. And I want to follow God. He's the most important thing there is. But no, I wouldn't want to know because if it were true, it would cost me my family. They'd lose the son they've always wanted. They'd lose all the respect they have in the community. If I became a Christian, it would destroy my family. I'm not sure I could live with that after all they've done for me. No. He said the silence that followed was pregnant. The sound of flowing water washed away any awkwardness, and we stood there another few minutes saying nothing. Finally, David asked, so who do you think would win, God or your family? And Nabil said it was a blunt question, but that's how I needed to hear it. God would win. And see, that's really what Jesus is saying in this passage. There might be a familial cost. There might be a cost in your relationships. Recently read another account of someone who came to Christ and experienced this sort of relational cost in his following of Jesus. Ten years ago, Beckett Cook was a gay man in Hollywood who had achieved great success as a set designer in the fashion industry. He worked with stars and supermodels from Natalie Portman to Claudia Schiffer, traveled the world to design photo shoots for the likes of Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. He attended award shows and parties at the homes of Paris Hilton and Prince. He spent summer swimming in Drew Barrymore's pool. But 10 years ago, Beckett Cook's life changed drastically when he encountered the gospel and surrendered his life to Jesus. He eventually completed a degree at Talbot School of Theology. He's written a memoir of his conversion entitled A Change of Affection, A gay man's incredible story of redemption. And I was interested to see this tweet from him just a couple days ago on January 2nd where he said this. He said, leaving the LGBTQ community is not unlike leaving a cult like Scientology. The kind of, or this kind of apostasy leads to all manner of threats, career canceling, and the complete rejection of lifelong friends. That's been his experience. But then he said, I wouldn't have it any other way. Jesus is worth it. See, some of you have experienced some of that. I mean, you've experienced it in your family or in other relationships. You say, look, if this is who you are, we don't want anything to do with you. There can be a relational cost to following Jesus. It means that our relationship with Jesus trumps all other relationships. And then thirdly, there might be a vocational cost. And I won't say a lot about this one just because of time. 
Jesus doesn't call everyone to change their vocations. He does call some people to do that. I mean, the, the first disciples he called were all fishermen, and they literally left their nets and followed him. But it is also possible that just some professions really don't allow you to maintain your faith. There's some things that might just be uneasy in your conscience. And you might have to say, look, I, I know I can make a lot of money at this, but it doesn't sit well with my soul. I told you this story before, but I think one of the stories that best illustrates this kind of thing is the story of Mickey Cohen, who was a notorious gangster in the 1940s and 50s. And he once attended a week-long evangelistic crusade where Billy Graham was preaching. He was quite attracted to the Christian faith. His trouble was he didn't want to stop being a gangster. And his contention was, there are Christian athletes and Christian actors and Christian politicians. Why can't I be a Christian gangster? Now, I know some of you might be wondering, well, what's the difference between a politician and a gangster? I get it, okay? Jesus doesn't call everyone to change vocations, but even with that, there still might be a vocational cost to your discipleship. You might perform your job differently, or hopefully you do perform your job differently because you are a follower of Jesus. You don't cut corners. You don't scam people. You do things with integrity. So it might simply mean that you're called to change the way you think about your vocation. It's a fourth potential cost that would-be disciples are invited to consider, and that is that there might be a physical cost. And I think it's very difficult for us to grasp this one, living where we do, but this is a reality for so many of our brothers and sisters around the world. One of the most impactful experiences of my adult life was spending 10 days in Turkey uh, training church planters and pastors from different North African countries. Now, they invited me there because they had no formal Bible training, and I was there to provide that. But as I spent time with these guys, what I realized was that I know nothing about the physical cost of discipleship. I mean, I've never been spit on or beaten up or thrown into prison or had my possessions taken away because I was preaching the gospel. But many of these guys had that experience or those experiences. And that is a price that many of our brothers and sisters around the world are paying right now. And Jesus' words in Matthew 5 become a lot more meaningful in a context like that. Where he said, blessed are you when others revile you. And persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now listen, we might not experience the physical side of it. It might just be the verbal side of it. But Jesus highlights that as well. Elsewhere, Paul tells us that everyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And I wonder sometimes if the reason we don't experience any of that in our lives is because we just seek to blend in with the crowd. We don't speak out about our faith at all. Lastly, let me just say that there will be a fundamental cost. So there might be all of those other costs, but there will be a fundamental cost. This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? And what I want to say is that every one of us is called to daily deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus. I've already said that cost might look different for different people. It might even cost you something different today to follow Jesus than it did yesterday. But Jesus' call to us is the same every single day. Take up your cross and follow me. And so that might seem like a high cost, but the rewards are worth it. And in the end, the person who chooses not to pay these costs 
loses in a big way. Jesus says they forfeit their own soul. Now, we're at the start of a new year. I know it's a, a time, as I said, with the gym. People make lots of new commitments, renew lots of commitments. I'm going to do this differently and that differently. But I think at the start of a new year, it's good for us to just remind ourselves what it means to follow Jesus and to commit ourselves to follow him each day. So let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you for your word. We thank you for the directness of Jesus. We thank you that all of our pretensions are sometimes stripped away and we realize uh, those excuses that we make or those things we try to hide. And so, Lord, we pray for our own hearts that we would be committed to following you in, uh, in our day-to-day lives, that each day we would have that mindset of being willing Um, to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow you. And God, we don't do this because we think it earns us favor or salvation with you. We do it because Jesus is the one who went to the cross for us. So we pray you would strengthen us uh, with that knowledge. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.